Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. Mark, how are things going over at GC Realty? Not bad, not bad. I am looking to replace myself on the business development side. So anybody listening, um, I'm putting together the job description and the minimum standards and requirements and all that stuff to uh, be a salesperson for property management services. So uh, if anyone that's in sales or anyone that's uh, uh, a realtor, maybe looking to, to transfer to something that's W-2, it doesn't necessarily have to, but all day long, I get to talk to real estate investors, uh, some more educated than others. But uh, if you know anybody that might be interested, I will have the official, by the time this comes out, I'll have everything posted. And, and, and it's going to be partial uh, 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 salary and then partial commission. So there's a good opportunity to make upwards uh, uh, probably over six figures. So pretty excited about getting that posted and training somebody. So cool. Congrats. Yeah, thanks. Man. What about yourself? I know you had an event on Monday. How'd that go? I was at an event. So uh, I was at the uh, multi-city family, or I'm sorry, I'm butchering the name of it, but the, the John Kasman, Nikki and RJ event that they have uh, on, on the Monday over at Chief O'Neill's. But it, it was awesome. It was the first time I've been in a while. Um, and then I, it was, you'd love this. It was, you know, someone's talking about Portage Park. I'm like, Ooh, obviously my ears perk up talking about Portage Park. And then, um, you know, Jason Wagner's there talking about his buildings he has over at like Lawrence, Milwaukee. And then there's a, there's a guy there who was talking about, it, and there's a girl, um, I think her name was Chelsea. She's like, oh, I have a three unit on Agatite and like, like four or five people, like in my, in my little neck of the woods there. So great 20 minutes of my life there. <laughs> Just oh, talking about awesome. three units in, in the Portage Park neighborhood. Oh, that's so, awesome. No, it was good. It's, it's, uh, we, again, just as a reminder to everyone, we have, we have everything on our, on our website, like look at all these different events. And if you are a vendor looking to add, we will add you on there as well. Um, you know, there's just, there's so many different opportunities to go out there and, and network. There's no excuse not to be doing it. Yeah, so, no, exactly. That, that could be a housing provider tip of the week, but go ahead and take us into, go ahead and take us into one. Well, this housing provider tip of this week, um, you know, I, I was on the conversation, I was on the phone yesterday with uh, Tyson Schultz um, leasing. I've, I've drawn a blank on his company, but uh he specializes in leasing all around the city. He's got a whole huge leasing team. Um, you worked with him, right, Tom? I think you've worked with him in the past. I believe so. Um, but we were talking to him in my conversation with him and our leasing manager. We were talking about how the leasing season has been kind of extended uh, these last couple of years because when COVID hit, a lot of uh, Chicago landlords, they pushed their normal June, July uh, move out dates to uh, August, September, October. So leasing season, this could be good or bad, but I think with the tip here is really just to be aware that uh, the traditional leasing season in Chicago is, is kind of stretched a little more. Now, that might mean that uh, there's people out looking for places uh, further into the fall. And that at the same time, it might mean that you're going to have more competition if you have your place listed in the fall. So just be uh, uh, cognizant of, uh, of the market, what's going on when your tenant's moving out and you're pre-leasing and, and so forth. So one thing to add there, the great advice, like don't default to a 12 month lease if it's not going to be in your benefit. Right. Oh yeah. Take, take them through the, like, I, I've seen that all the time. Like, man, why is this lease going November to November? That's stupid. Like that goes November to the next March. Like that, it becomes a, whatever, how many months that is 16 months, like get it on a good cycle moving forward. Yeah. We started that uh, about four years ago. So anything that, that renews or starts uh, September 1st or later, we'll do 14 to 16 month leases, which puts you into uh, yeah, get late winter, spring. spring. Yeah. So our, our, even for us, uh, everything picks up in February. As long as we're not uh, uh, having anything in that end of the year, I, I think we're good. But yeah, that's awesome. I'm happy you brought that up because that's something that's really helped us uh, really just kind of get on a good cycle for the entire company. All right. All right. Today's guest. Pumped. It's been, it's been a while. This is another one where we, we should have had John earlier. Um, but he's been with Intera for eight years. He has sold over 200 properties, over $650 million in sales. Also an investor himself. We are recording this in July, and he's already sold over $100 million this year alone. Um, I think he might be our first uh, Iowa Hawkeye graduate on the show as well. So without sure. further ado, Joe Smazel, welcome to the show. How are you doing, Joe? Everything's good, guys. Appreciate you having me on. We're excited. I've, now, uh, Joe, a, you said you've been been a listen, you're a listener, so uh, you, you, you know we're we're ready for you to answer the last questions and get the Chicago fact right. Similar to Jeff Weinberg last week. 
Uh, I'm sure Jeff set a high bar. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you guys have put out a lot of good content. I've met some resources through the show. So um, I appreciate you guys having me on. Awesome. All right. So most people who know you know you as the guy who has sold $100 million halfway through a year. You didn't start <laughs> there, right? So let's talk a little bit about just getting started here. And, and this can go for investors. This can go for brokers. We all see the highlight. We all see the top of the mountain. But talk us through that first year. One, why did you get into this? And then just give us the oral history of the first 12 months of being a commercial broker. Sure, sure. Um, I left a stable job uh, that had some growth opportunities that just didn't feel like um, where I wanted to be. It didn't feel like a career path um, that I wanted to be at five or 10 years down the road. So there was no immediate issue um, and it was a, it was a good gig. Um, but I just, I thought that I wanted to start my own business and, uh, without knowing anything about real estate, it seemed like a common denominator, uh, in some successful people who, um, who I admired and, and liked the lifestyle. So, um, I started to explore different interviews within, uh, within commercial real estate brokerage. Um, I didn't know anybody in Chicago real estate. Um, I knew very little even about the geography in Chicago at that point. I had been in the city for like two years. Um, so I didn't know the neighborhoods. I didn't know the nuances. Um, and, but I was confident in kind of betting on myself and real estate felt like a good avenue to do that. Um, this was in 2000, I don't know, made the decision probably in like late 2010 beginning of 2011, which wasn't a very popular time to get into real estate, um, probably allowed me to ramp up a little faster than, than somebody starting today. There was a little bit less competition. Some people who I think were towards the end of their careers who, or who weren't all in, I think were kind of weeded out um, during the downturn. Um, so I ended up um, interviewing and getting a job with Marcus and Millichap, a big national firm um, that a lot of people in investment real estate in Chicago are probably familiar with. Um, I've got a lot of good friends that are still there and met a lot of great people there. It was a good place to learn. Um, and I made no money <laughs> for six months, um, which, you know, to their credit was, you know, basically what they told you to prepare for. Um, I, uh, I was really frugal, you know, it meant a lot of sacrifices with lifestyle. Um, my girlfriend then, you know, wife now is really supportive and I didn't have kids or a mortgage or anything at that point. So I was just, I was working all the time. <laughs> we moved into a studio that was like, it's like a glorified studio. Um, it was like a block from my office. So I was, it was really easy for me to get there early and to stay late. And, um, and the first deal was like six months in and I made like $4,500 or something, you know? Um, and so let's talk about uh, the first deal. Yeah. Mark, Mark, go um, ahead and comment here before, before we jump in. Well, I just want to, to anybody that doesn't have children yet, <laughs> you, you referenced the, the come go when you want work as late as you want. That changes no matter what, no matter your, your, your husband, wife, spouse, whatever, um, th that all changes when you start having kids. And you also want to be there too. Uh, so um, do those, those grinding hours and, and that, that putting that, that time in uh, early on uh, for, for your younger listeners or your single listeners. Yeah, 100, 100%. <laughs> So, 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 so Joe, we got a whopping 4,500 bucks in our pocket. Like, let's talk through this deal here. What, how did you finally get someone knocked out? How many no's did you hear before that? I mean, yeah, I was making thousands of phone calls. Um, and it was, I had a system. So my, my geographic focus was Jefferson township. So, um, which includes, you know, Tom said that he loves to talk about on the Northwest side of the city. Um, but it's basically North Avenue, so 1600 on the on the southern border, to Devon, which is 6400 north, I think, um, to the north, and then to the east. I'm not sure what the screen uh, if, if the, to the east is the same. <laughs> um, to the east was Western Avenue, 2400 west, and then west to Harlem, 72 or 74. Um, so it's a big. I mean, it's a big area of the city, but a lower 
it was a lower density um, market than some of the other north side markets. So it's covering kind of a bigger territory, but for a similar, um, you know, basically similar kind of stack, you know, for the for the type of buildings we're calling on. So, um, you know, I would call through some areas in the morning one day, and then I would try to hit those areas in the afternoon or evenings. And, you know, I had a system for recording my calls and when I would, um, or recording, like taking notes, not recording what I'm talking um and you know when to leave a voicemail when not to leave a voicemail what i said you know i was pretty systematic with it um the first deal i talked about um i talked about recently on a, a buddy of mine started a podcast um called the rise and invest podcast i talked about the first deal was a nine unit building um in belmont craig in kind of the border of belmont craig in porridge park it was a deal that was expired um it was expired by somebody else it was an older polish couple it was, you know, awesome, like great people. Um, and I ended up selling it to a guy that I've done like 25 deals with, um, you know, 12 years later. Um, I was thinking I might be able to a- answer the question with um, my first like bigger deal, which was my third overall deal. Is that fair? <laughs> Let's go for it. Let's hear it. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, this was, a, this, it was, uh, I was calling probably on the 5518 West Berry, which is the first deal I sold. And there was a guy in the market who was a long-term owner of three buildings. And there were two really nice courtyards and one um, nice 12-unit walk-up building. Um, and I was really, he had given me like a hint that he was, that he was thinking about selling. So once I kind of get like a, a taste, I'm very, um, I'm very good at the follow-up. I'm very persistent with that. Um, you know, I don't like to just like bang my head against the phone and not listen to what the other person is saying, but if they've indicated that there's some desire to sell, um, you know, I'm very good at following up. So, um, that was the case here. I called him a million times. He finally, he was like a do it yourself guy driving around in the pickup truck, um, and was always at the building. So I finally pinned him down on when he was going to be at, um, his smallest building, which was a 12 unit building. And uh, Marcus and Milchap was, I don't know if it's still the policy, but they were very like strict about wearing a suit and tie or a shirt and tie at least every day. It was like middle of summer. I meet him in the boiler room. We're sitting on paint cans, you know, in my like Joseph A. Bass suit. <laughs> He's like <laughs> absolutely chain smoking cigarettes, leaning against the boiler, talking to me. And um, the meeting goes well. Um, he is interested in my opinion of value. He rattles off the, uh, the rent roll by memory, like with dates and everything. And gives me the expenses, you know, which are rounded to the hundred, you know, which, you know, are just not precise. So you just, you take them with a grain of salt. Um, I turn around an opinion of value in like a day because I knew, I mean, I knew that market inside and out, even though I wasn't working in it for that long. So I turn it around quick. Um, he was cool with it. Um, he was cool with the value, made a really quick decision to hire me. Um, and, you know, this is 2000, I think 2011. Um, and it was just a totally different, totally different dynamic in the marketplace. I mean, it was like, you know, the, the easier part of the equation was getting the inventory, whereas now it's really tough to get the inventory, but there's always pretty reliable buyer demand in what I sell. At that point, it was like making, you know, there we go, just making a thousand more calls to try to get people just in the door for a deal that was like, I don't know, 70,000 a unit, maybe 71,000 a unit, which is, you know, <laughs> it's easily double that now. Um, so he saw the hustle really quick and, um, and he uh, was interested in the opinion for the two courtyard buildings, which made a 66 unit portfolio. And um, so we listed those and then that was like a totally different level of credibility for me calling in the market as opposed to having nine unit buildings and 12 unit buildings and 66 units. And that, that economies of scale allowed me to call with that deal in other markets kind of throughout the north side of the city and really gain more credibility. Um, so at the risk of like getting real long winded, it was pretty well received. We got an offer that was pretty good and um, he didn't immediately take it. And then one night, on a Friday night, he called me at like seven or seven thirty, and he's like, "All right, I'll do it." And I told my wife, "I'm like, I gotta drive up there. Like, I don't, I don't want to miss the opportunity. Like, I don't want to wait till tomorrow." He's been noodling on this, and I don't know how long the guy's gonna be around. The market sucks, you know. I'm driving up there, and so I drove up there. I got there at like eight thirty. He's he lives an hour and a half away. 
Um, and he's in the front yard with his shirt off, his dog's running around, and he signed the contract um, on the hood of my old Jeep, and his dog's like freaking jumping up on me. Um, and I think that was a really long answer, so I'll save you the – it was a – it turned out to be more of a mess of a deal than I even thought at that point, but it closed and it's a $4 million deal that put a couple bucks in my pocket, gave me the cushion, gave me the confidence and um, was kind of off to the races then. That's awesome. So Joe, do you have like just a rough idea? Like, are you talking thousands of phone calls before this happens? Well, so the, the like, the standard was to make 50 calls a day or like the target was to make 50 like new calls a day, talk to 10 or 12 new people, like have a constructive conversation with 10 or 12 new people and set, set and go on one meeting a day. It was kind of like the goal. So, I um, mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thousands of calls. That's, that's the grind, the grind no one talks about. So no, I, assume- I mean, like when you start, I mean, it's sorry, Tom, it's like, when you start, you're missing vacations, you're making less money than your friends. And like, it just, you know, you're overworked and underpaid. (laughs) And in real estate specifically, like, you know, the shows are glamorized. Like if you go on social media or LinkedIn or whatever, you know, you see, yeah, I'm guilty of it too. Like self-promotion is a part of the business. So I'm posting that I sold a hundred million dollars in real estate this year because that's how I advertise my services. But like for somebody starting out, they need to know the story to it too. Otherwise it's just like, it's false hope or it's not, it's not the whole picture. So um, I think, like you said, at the beginning of the question goes for everybody, like whether you're an investor or you're a broker, or you, you know, you work it within the real estate as a vendor. I mean, you have to, it, it becomes who you know, and it becomes who your network, which can compound as you do it and get a lot easier. But when you start, especially if you don't really have a head start, it's a grind. Yeah, for, for realtors, it's just your average realtor. They say fifty percent of what uh, what you do, you ultimately never get paid for. And when you're a new broker, I think it's it's probably closer to that eighty uh, percent. You literally spend eighty percent of your time just trying to figure out what you need to do <laughs> to make money. So, uh, yeah. but then ultimately, yeah, it does. You're right. It goes. It comes down to your network, and and you don't have to, a lot of people are like I, I need. I don't have a big enough network, but you, you have to create that network, and and that's part of that grind up front. And there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of attrition in, in real estate brokerage, whether it's commercial or, or residential, I think. I mean, I know that I see the commercial side firsthand. Um, that I, and some of it's avoidable. You know, like if I have somebody that's talking to me, whether I know them or it's my best friend that's talking to me about being interested in real estate, like I think the first part of it is just really, really vetting it on the front end to being confident that this is what you want to do for the long haul. Um, because I've seen a lot of people who um, are smart, personable people who were looking at it more as like a stepping stone to something else or um, as like, um, you know, if they're kind of in limbo and what they want to do in a career path, like if you're going to be successful, you're going to really have to work at it. I just don't think that it fills like a void in a, in a career path, unless it's really what you want to do for the long term. Um, so I just, I, when people ask me about it, I, I try to encourage them to really vet it probably to an extreme on the front end and not get, um, not get like kind of enchanted by the goal of, you know, five or 10 years down the road. Well, I, I think a lot of uh, people that want to get into it, I think there's such a learning curve because there, most brokerages, there is limited structure. What you laid out for Marks and Millichap, I'm even on the commercial or office or industrial side, there's, there's structure there, but it's still a huge learning curve. How to talk to yeah. somebody is not something they could learn in a book. They have to literally spend X amount of hours standing with the guy that's in your office, understanding how the flow of that conversation should go, who should be the expert in certain moments and who shouldn't be. And I think uh, that ultimately is a time period that a lot of people don't make it through to what you're saying. The learning curve, like, I don't know if it's just like a mental, you know, I, I, I looked at it as kind of like a graduate school program almost, you know, for the first year. Cause I'm like, you know, I'm starting a new job, which I really want to be like a business within a business. Um, but it was like, I knew that there was going to be this time where I had to learn a ton <laughs> and I wasn't going to make much money. So I kind of looked at it, 
you know, just as like a mental trick, like this is just paying your due, paying your dues. Like this is just the, the like graduate school type, <laughs> um, like segue into getting into real estate. So, um, it, it helped me. I don't, you know, but I, I think that you have to be eyes wide open about the ramp up period and you have to be just prepared personally and financially to, to be able to make it through because, um, there's a lot of attrition just in that stage. It, there, there's such a, uh, um, I know I was guilty of this, of there's a period when you first, uh, whether you first get licensed or first start actually moving deals where you're more of a gopher for clients than you are the expert. And there's a transformation. And sometimes it doesn't happen to five, six years later when, when you actually start getting burned by things and you start really standing up to your clients saying, listen, man, you can't make that decision because of blank, yeah. blank, and blank. And, and it's, that that's even longer learning curve to actually truly become the expert in the, in the conversation. Did you, um, for, for a while, I was like embarrassed about, I don't know if I was embarrassed is the right word, but self-conscious about um, not knowing everything <laughs> at the beginning. And then, you know, there's something like clicked where I just, you know, I'm an honest guy. Like I, I, I was honest with people, but I felt like I had to talk myself out of answers or around like answers sometimes. And I was just like, you know, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I used it almost like as an advantage. Like, I'm, you know, I'm newer to this. What I don't know, I make up for and hustle. And, you know, I'll definitely find out of that answer. I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. But, like, I think um, showing the sincerity in the answer and that you're going to work really hard. Like, I knew when I met those people, um, the first building I sold or, you know, the 10th building I sold or whatever, like, I didn't know as much as all my competitors. But I was really confident and I and I did. Um, outwork anybody in the market, period. And that's what I knew I could promise somebody. So I knew I would make more calls and anything that I didn't know, I'd go to my mentor, I'd go to my manager and get answered appropriately to make sure that it's handled the right way. But I think when I flip, kind of flipped the switch on that and stopped worrying about not being able to know everything and started just embracing kind of where I was in my career at that point, um, it was received a lot better by, by clients. I think there's such an advantage today of what's out there on the internet. I mean, I, my, I think there's two learning curves. I think there's when you're a real estate agent, I think there's the, um, the understanding, the, the actual numbers, the, when we were talking about investment property specifically, understanding the investment and understanding the jargon, the, the, uh, you know, the FAR, like all those crazy things that they definitely don't teach you, uh, through the IDFPR courses. Um, there, there's that part that now there's a lot more out there. For me, I remember just sitting on LoopNet for hours um, on end, just looking at deals and understanding what things meant. And then there's the other part of just the, the transaction flow. Uh, what's normal, what's right, You know, when's the attorney overstepping themselves or when is the attorney suck and not doing their job? When's the lender dragging ass? Like, I, I think uh, those two types, those two directions uh, are the two areas that you really can, if we're gonna break down the whole expert part and, and, uh, and it takes years to learn both those. Some do it faster than others on one or the other. And that usually offsets the weakness on the other side. I totally agree. And sometimes I think like what you just described is an advantage in today's market where like you can, you can, you know, you have access to pretty much everything like online. Um, but sometimes like when you started, it might've been, you know, you were probably able to, outwork somebody and, and like absorb the knowledge faster than other people who might've been able to fake it a little bit more in today's, you know, in today's world where everything is so Googleable. Well, the, the crazy <laughs> thing now is uh, I, I, it's, it's totally flipped. So for me, I, so I got my license in 2003 and, and the whole before the crash and, and before, you know, all the red fins of the world. Stuff. So I, I truly like would find, properties for clients. You know, you're at LoopNet or CoStar, yeah. or there's a couple other amateur ones back then, but you had to find the property for the clients. And then once it went under contract, you kind of wiped your hands and, and everything kind of just happened at that point. Now it's like that stuff's usually out there and there's some cold calling and stuff like that. But uh, now it's getting it from the offer to the closing table is truly the where the uh, brokers earn their money, I think. So that's been a huge shift in the last two decades of just our industry as a whole. The biggest yeah. thing that comes to mind, you know, on that is um, when I started and this is, you know, this is 11 or 12 years ago, whatever um, it was like building your database is very manual. Like it was, um, it was like, I mean, <laughs> sorry, my, 
my Act. supportive wife, like to the, to the point where like, when we, you know, when we were spending time together, she would come with me to like drive around the Northwest side of the city on the weekends or in the evening or whatever, like to take pictures of buildings and take pictures of signs and take pictures of dumpsters because they have, you know, the management sign on it. Um, and, you know, I had an online catalog, of, you know, that I took notes that, you know, this building looks shabby, it's in really good shape. Sometimes you see the guy around, and, you know, gal, and introduce yourself, whatever. Um, and now it's all on COSAR and everybody's phone numbers there, <laughs> email addresses there, picture of the buildings there, last time it's sold, mortgage information, you know. And the guys that were 10 years before me were like, oh, you have it easy because, you know, here's my catalog of like Polaroid pictures with, the, with the, you know, notes on the back. So, the markets definitely evolve and like, um, you know, information gets easier or, you know, but again, I was, I, I'm kind of happy that I had to do all that because I don't think anybody else is driving around with their girlfriend, like taking pictures on buildings on the weekend. Yeah, no, for sure. You do have that advantage. I, I, I actually, I was cleaning out something in the office a couple of weeks ago and I found ACT. It used to be a CRM, a- ACT. Um, and that, yeah. that was what I had to carry around uh, to download it to the different computers that I wanted to use it on. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I had to hope the data transferred every time or otherwise I had to go to one of my backup CDs that I had it on uh, to upload it. So definitely my new CRM now that whoever takes that uh, sales position that uh, is going to replace me, they have a much better CRM. So <laughs> I was going to say, you're not selling the position really well here, dude. No, no, no. We got, I, I, I fixed all those. those, those, those bricks. So, so Joe, we started having some success here that, like, you know, those, those two courtyard buildings lead into, all right, we're starting to get a flow here you know what let's talk about like did you start having a focus on certain areas right like at some point you get the you get to a position where it's like all right this is my bread and butter and whether it be building type location how did that evolve and what is that for you like what is what is the joe smazel special yeah yeah um so it started with a tighter you know i, I mentioned jefferson park being you know obviously a pretty broad area but um it started with that as a really, really laser focus, that area. Um, like when I saw, it's probably gonna be a little bit of a tangent, but um, go for when it. I sold the 66 unit building or portfolio, um, it gave me credibility with a guy who had 135 unit portfolio, six buildings, um, same market, Porter's Park. Um, and he was in Arizona and I was hammering him and, um, uh, He's like, all right, I'm coming to town. Um, meet me on Saturday at like Hilton or Marriott or whatever out by O'Hare. And um, so I was just like, I was so stoked. There's so many calls. It's got, you know, it's a big portfolio. Um, and I get out there and I brought my a guy who was like mentoring me at the time. And there was like a like a comic book or like a uh, like a Pokemon type convention and everybody was dressed up. Like I, it, like it was a scene like I'm <laughs> like swarming like swarming the lobby. So they're like I don't know what exactly they were there for, but everybody was dressed up, and I'm like, um, and I call him. I'm like, uh, you know, where are you? He's like, I'm by the elevator, and um, I'm like, I said to my my mentor Jamie, I'm like. I didn't take this guy for somebody like who'd be into this stuff, but he says he's like right around here somewhere. And we looked for him for like half an hour and it was just a shit show. And sorry, um, it was just like hectic in there and call him back. I'm like, Mike, I don't see you anywhere, man. And he's like, I'm by the elevators. I'm like at the, at the, I forget the specific hotel, Marriott Hilton. He's like, yeah, we figure we figure out that there's two, there's two Hiltons or Marriott's out by O'Hare and he's at the other one. So <laughs> we show up and it's like, we're half an hour late to the meeting. Now we were like half an hour early. We're half an hour late to the meeting and he's literally taking a nap at, at the bottom of the elevator. So um, I don't know why I brought that up, but it was, uh, <laughs> it reminded me because the 66 unit portfolio led to a portfolio that, you know, I ultimately sold, sold that as 135 units is about twice the size and the 135 units, just the way the 66 unit deal provided me you know some legs they say like deals have babies or you know there's a compounding effect to the activity um it was the same case so you know it kind of opened up a broader area for me to call in and um i think a mistake that too many people make at the beginning is kind of chasing deals as opposed to having a focus and a niche i mean chicago is a big market and there's a lot of really good people who are in real estate in chicago really smart and really active so 
I very much believe in um, having an itch and sp- sticking to it. And that means sometimes bringing in somebody on a deal and, you know, it looks like a delusion of fee that, you know, means a lot of money, but it, it also provides the ability to stay focused on what my, you know, what my focus is at that time. And, and my focus is still selling middle market size apartment buildings um, in Chicago. You know, a, a huge percentage of my business is in the city, um, probably 85 five-ish, 80% of it, something like that. It's on the north side of the city. Um, two to call it, you know, 40, $40 million buildings, um, which ends up being, you know, 10 to a couple hundred units generally. Um, and then the remaining part of my business is in, uh, in and around Hyde Park, um, which ends up having kind of similar pricing metrics, similar drivers um, as some of the north side markets. So I have... Um, that's what I've been doing for the last 12 years <laughs> and sticking to it. Yeah, just a quick comment on that. I think uh, even if you can't figure out what your niche is, it's just keeping yourself within geographic boundaries. Um, I, I know I would run up uh, to Gurney for a, uh, for a condo sale for the same thing I would go for to Moni for a 10,000 square foot lease on an industrial building. So uh, t- one totally two different dollar amounts and, uh, and just kind of keep yourself uh, uh, grounded on, on, you know, six counties, choose three of them and, and make, and, and, and find people to refer in the other one to make whole bucks that way. Like that, that's the other strategy that, um, that I took up with trying to cover the whole six counties, but yet not be able to service it, but still make a couple bucks. Yeah. So, so Joe, we're, we're into this, you know, call it the bigger space. Now we're established. You talked about bringing in other people. How is how have things changed now? Meaning, how is it easier for you? Right, I'm assuming like you still got to grind. I'm not. I don't want to take anything away from you, but I'm assuming you don't have to make thousands of phone calls to get that next deal. Like you said, you know, deals have babies. Talk about that amplifying effect, right? Like just how life is still. It's still hard. I don't want to take anything away, but it's got to be on a different level than it was ten years ago for you. Yeah, I mean. I think the biggest thing about it is you just get to know people, <laughs> you know, you, I get to, I, I, at this point, I really, you know, throughout my career, but, you know, after doing it for 12 years, very actively, um, you know, I feel like I have really good relationships with um, a, a big network in Chicago. You know, if you are active in Chicago multifamily, um, I try to know you and I have a good reputation in the market and a good track record. So, um, there's a compounding effect to the activity, but then the other side of it is, and there's like, you know, I have some name recognition. I have a track record now and I am, you know, I am much more of an expert so I can, you know, talk to talk better than I used to, um, or walk the walk, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but I, um, but I think the biggest thing is the compounding effect of the network and the relationships that that, that, breeds because when I bring a deal out now, you know, I kind of can go to a, a definable list of buyers and create a marketplace for it pretty quickly, as opposed to like recreating the wheel every time I have a new deal. And there's new people that come and go from the market. Um, and it's my job to stay in touch with that, but um, it does get easier for sure. I mean, I think the hard part about it is that, you know, I um, still feel like you're as good as your next deal, you know, and, and it's, it's tiring sometimes because um, it is a grind still. It's a grind kind of in different ways. But um, I feel like if I sleep at the wheel, um, you know, somebody's going to pass me. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of good competitors um, that know what they're doing. And so I feel a constant kind of itch um, to continue being active. Awesome. So Joe, I, we want to talk about all these different North side neighborhoods due to time. You know, I just want to break down a few. We haven't talked about Lakeview all that much. And to most investors, they hear Lakeview and they think, oh, that's too much price per door. That's you know, out-of-state money, just parking money somewhere. There's no way to actually make those numbers work. What do you say to those comments? It's mostly not out-of-state money is the first thing. I mean, um, a huge percentage of the deals that sell in Lakeview are sold to local owner operators <laughs> or local investors with, you know, with management companies. Um, but yeah, it's, it's mostly a, it's a local market. I mean, it is, it is expensive relative to other markets of the city, but um, 
you know, to each their own. They're um, in what I sell in Lakeview, middle market space. Um, the challenge in creating more velocity is the scarcity of inventory because of typically long hold periods. Um, you know, Lakeview is a really strong rental market, really diverse rental market. A lot of you know smaller walk-up buildings, kind of mid-market size buildings like what I sell. There's some like vintage high-rise stock. You know, some of that's condo though too. Um, and then, you know, there's some class A fully amenitized. So it kind of runs the gamut um, of housing stock, but as a percentage of the overall stock, the new stuff really, is a, it doesn't move the needle much, you know, and there's always, a, there's been a lot of demand historically in Lakeview. Um, it's gotten cooler around Wrigleyville. Um, but because of that scarcity of inventory, when I have something to sell, that's a decent size, you know, in my two to $40 million range, um, typically a captive audience of buyers for it. And that means folks um, that are, you know, sometimes looking at them either globally or as a generational hold, or um, at least are willing to pay up for the quality of the asset and the quality of, you know, knowing, or the, the I guess, confidence and knowing that you're going to have a strong rental market for it going forward. So it might not meet everybody's return thresholds in the near term, but, um, it's no surprise to me why people pay the prices that they do in Lakeview. Got it. You know, when, when I'm evaluating properties in that area, one of the things that I struggle with is, you know, things that are, they're vintage, but they were updated, you know, 1995 or whatever. Right. And you're not going to get that at a completely vintage or distressed pricing. Like there is some value there and that throws off my numbers for wanting to, you know, come in and just knock everything out and, and have fun with it. So, like how how do you see people succeed in those situations when there's when there's been some sort of rehab done to it it's not distressed it's not it's not turnkey it's it's in that that weird like where it's hard to do that value add play based on what they've done to the property already but it's truly not top of the line right like i, I it's a tough question i'm probably not articulating it very smoothly no i, I think i get it i mean the nine times out of 10, the answer to that question is the buyer pool for that is comfortable operating at pretty similar to how it's running. You know, and that's not for everybody. Some people like to operate only a certain level of finish or only a certain you know rehab quality or only with laundry and unit or only individual HVAC. But um, the buyers generally, if it's kind of a workable condition, but not necessarily to today's standards, um, are typically going to beat somebody on pricing who's looking at it as kind of a blank slate. Um, there, and the exception to that, the, you know, the one out of 10 is um, instances where somebody has a really aggressive um, or unique or creative like value add plan, you know, um, duplexing down, using unused zoning capacity, you know, building on an adjacent lot. Um, the ADU ordinance um, has created some opportunities where people have been able to unlock some value and, and otherwise, you know, kind of um, undervalued spaces or unutilized spaces. So, um Generally, Tom, it's like somebody saying, um, you know, I'm a, I, I don't need it to be, I don't need it to be today's finishes. I'm fine operating stuff that's 25 years old. I know that there's demand for it. Um, I'm going to put my professional spin on it, or I'm going to put my management in place, or I'm going to roll this into the fold and roll this 40 unit building into the fold with another, you know, 2000 units that are just like it. Um, so that's generally the buyer profile for those types of deals in my experience. Awesome. Great answer there. Mark, anything else to add? I was listening to one of our earlier episodes um, and we, we did all the boundaries for a couple of the early neighborhoods. Um, can, can you just break down specific layout where Lake is? Because I know whether you're buying or selling, yeah. uh, that that differs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For, well, I'm a neighborhood. I, I hate it when people fudge neighborhoods. I'm a neighborhood purist. So if you see one of my books and... Uh, and you think that I was too generous on, you know, uh, like West Bucktown or, you know, something like that, you know, please call me on it. Um, but you, know, <laughs> you tell me the river's Southern not Borders, West Lakeview. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, it's a city of neighborhoods and I feel like nobody, um, most of them, there's some, you know, there's a little subjectivity to some of them. So sometimes you look at it, you're like, all right, depending on what map you look at, sure. Okay. But I mean, Generally, they're pretty definable. So Lakeview is um, the southern border is diversity. Um, the eastern border is the lake. Um, and then north 
to Irving Park. Um, north of Irving Park, there's a little pocket called Buena Park that kind of straddles it, that hugs the lake as well. West, you know, is going to sound a little, I don't know if this is like kind of corny coming out of the guy who just talked about how he's a purist, but West the there is kind of some, most people, okay, so you say Ravenswood or you could say the tracks is 1800 West. You know, some people say 1600 West, but I like my favorite, one of my favorite pockets of Lakeview is that pocket between Ashland and Ravenswood where Lincoln Avenue comes up. I think you've got a great stretch of Lincoln there. You can still get to the Southport Corridor stuff. There's good housing stock. There's cool amenities. The Brown Line's right there. Brown Line's a great train. So 1800 to the West. Some people then go a little further and bring in like the Roscoe Village, St. Ben's, North Center type markets and consider that all part of greater Lakeview. Um, But that's the general area. Got it. So yeah, would you like, I guess, where would you say North Center is then if you're going to go that far? Because in my head, that's like the tracks are like the dividing point going. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think you're I think actually that I could look it up, but that'd be cheating. I think the Chicago neighborhood, like city of Chicago neighborhood map, I think includes some of North Center in like Lakeview. I think it might all be called Lakeview, but North Center, I look at as Irving Park to like Roscoe or Addison. Well, I guess Addison and then Western Avenue to the West. But then, yeah, I guess maybe you call some of that around Western and Irving North Center too. Um, And then going east to the track or Ravenswood Avenue. Cool. We got very Chicago there. Someone just listening, out-of-state investor. Breaking down my neighborhood here. Right now I, you know what? One of my favorite parts of being in, in real estate, I grew up in Iowa. So I went to Iowa and I grew up in Iowa and like, I love knowing the city. I, I, um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I know just about every street in, the, in my markets and I know like what hundred block it is. And I know, you know, the coffee shops to go to. Um, it's, I think it's one of the funnest parts about working in real estate in Chicago is the attachment that it gives you to the city. Um, Cause you take a lot of pride, I think in the city and, and the cool things about it. And then you, you know, figure out a way to kind of put up with some of the bullshit too. But um, yeah, I think it's one of the best ways. I think it's one of the coolest things about real estate is getting out of the city. Well, that's awesome. Mark, anything else? Or is that a good one to wrap on? It's a good one to wrap on. Good response. Let's do it. All right. I think you prepared for these. So um, we're expecting stellar replies. So <laughs> as a broker, what's your competitive advantage? How have you been able to hit the volume that you've hit while others just wish they could? Um, it's, it, it's redundant to what we talked about earlier, but um, my relationships within the network and the market that I work, um, I think are second to none. And I've got a good reputation um, for putting clients' interests out of mine. Um, and I've been active in doing it for, for 10 or so years, which has helped a lot. What is one piece of advice you would tell someone that has yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Hmm. Um, I forgot about this one. <laughs> Tom called me earlier. Tom called me earlier. He's like, are you nervous? I was like, I don't know. Not really. But I, I do have answers to the questions that you ask all the time. And I did not go back and cheat and listen to him. I thought I knew them all. And I forgot to write that one down. So um, this one is, is uh, winged. I would say um, build out, I, this might be redundant to an answer somebody's given in the past, but kind of build out your, like, um, your resource list or your vendor list or your, you know, your team um, before you need them. <laughs> because I think, you know, it, it, you're going to have to rely on your attorney and your lender options and, you know, your inspector and, you know, your management company and your leasing team, get to know those type of people, see what they look, what they look for and how to kind of make their lives easier once you get started. Um, so I think getting to know as many people as you can that you're going to need to rely on um, before you need them will help you a lot because if you're scrambling for a management company, um, you know, call GC Realty, but um, if you need an inspector or something like, you know, know them before you need them, I guess. Um, so try to build out that team. Awesome. What neighborhood do you live in? you live in the city? Yeah, we're in Lincoln Park. All right. All right. Yeah. What do you do for fun? Um, a lot of family time. I've got two young, my wife and I, I have two young boys. Um, 
who are a riot, but um, definitely keep us busy. Um, try to go to Long Beach, Indiana as much as we can, especially when it's nice out. Um, but uh, and then I'm, yeah, I like to play golf. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I think I'm like right on the verge of being like almost good. And then most of the time I'm just freaking trash and I wonder why I play. <laughs> so all, the but, things, uh, good ex- all the things you do for fun are a very cliche commercial broker. Like, like you just- totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Real original, bro. You hang out with your kids and you, uh, <laughs> my buddies, um, and this is a tangent. You can cut this out if you want, but like my friends are, um, we have a very critical, uh, critical relationship with each other, I guess. And so he's like, um, you know, I was putting it on my Instagram for a while, like the stuff I'd put on LinkedIn and, and it just wasn't worth, like, it wasn't worth <laughs> hearing about it. You know, every time I post, oh, <laughs> you can make, you can all, make much more money, deal. but it wasn't worth the, the group all, of friends. <laughs> yeah. We're all so impressed, you know? And so like, whenever I would say, if I would have said something like that to them, Mark, they'd say that's a very, CRE broker answer of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. that with me too with uh, um, the industrial stuff. T3 lighting. Oh, Mark, tell us about T3 lighting in, in your warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Joe, what is a good book, podcast, or self development activity that you'd recommend to our listeners? Um, so, my buddy uh, Drew Brenneman started a podcast recently called the Rise and Invest Podcast, which I think is off to a real good start. Um, and then I like a podcast too um, uh, from a guy named Peter Vonder, like Vonder A. I don't know, uh, but it's called Behind the Bricks. Um, he's New York based. He's a multifamily broker, but even though it's not Chicago specific, I mean it's quite the opposite. It's New York specific, but um, you know it's a big complex market, um, and I think it's just an interesting podcast. And from afar, I have a lot of respect for that guy's business, so um, I think that's a good one too. That you kind of pull some bits and pieces that are actually relevant, but if nothing else, it's an interesting one. It's a better name than us too. Behind the bricks. Better name. Behind the bricks. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you're not yeah, sure. I, don't, I think you're not good. Or it's not. That's yeah, true. So I guess you could be investing in Bitcoin as a straight up Chicago investor too, I guess. So maybe, maybe we're not clear either. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Besides yourself, name one person, your local network, you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm working with a guy right now named Mark Dykstra, who's uh, or is a really good guy, but you know, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm working with him, so it's kind of like half <laughs> recommending myself. Um, so I'll go with two other Intera guys who um, are kind of on the earlier end of their careers, um, Sam, Sam Gutierrez and, and um, Max Grossman. They work on the southwest and like southwest sides of the city, but um, – I wanted to recommend them because I see them in here in the office, like putting in the work and putting in the right type of work. And I think anybody in your network that's active in those areas um, would find them to be a good, a good resource for inventory. Um, And I see them in here working hard every day. Awesome. We will link to both of them in the show notes here. So Joe, thank you so much. You have provided a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Um, you know, I, my job is to add value to other people's acquisitions, dispositions, or, or, you know, when I can't ownership. Um, so I guess inter- introducing, uh, me to any friends that are, you know, active in multifamily real estate in Chicago, and I'll do my best to be a good resource for them. Um, whatever that means, um, I'm very easy to get in touch with, um, in this to do it for the long haul. <laughs> so, um, I guess expanding my network would be, would be helpful from the listeners, but otherwise be good to get to know them anyway. Good stuff. All right. And as you were talking, Mark started pacing back and forth, getting ready for his Chicago facts, <laughs> See, just getting amped up over there for kickoff. All right. So where is the Western boundary of Lakeview? Yeah. <laughs> TBD. <laughs> All right. So w- we mentioned our guest today is an Iowa Hawkeye. So I, I wanted to incorporate Iowa in some way. And I found, I found a way. Susan, uh, this one goes out to Susan Calamari. I might pronounce that wrong, but uh, she's got a three flat in Tri Taylor. So uh, All right. Susan, if I get this right, then uh, you get a gift card brought to you by Renovo. <laughs> so, so Mark, Iowa street, it's actually an East West running street. 
It stretches across several neighborhoods. So again, it's an east-west street. It's a side street. It's nestled between these two major corridors. I'll give you multiple choice. Fullerton and Armitage, North and Division, Augusta and Chicago, Fulton and Washington. Give me one more. Yeah, give me the give me those one more time. Fullerton and Armitage, North and Division, Augusta and Chicago, Fulton and Washington. But the what? the answers are going north to south. Yeah, uh, I would say North and Division. Joe, do you want to take a crack as well? Yeah, I'd, I'd go um, Chicago to Division. Oh, you're, you're cheating. You're getting eight blocks there. <laughs> well, what are you, what were, all right, it's between Chicago and Augusta. Okay. That is correct. Chicago so, and Augusta. Yeah. So, Susan, we still, I mean, Joe got it. We'll, we'll give, we'll, it's Renovo's money. I don't care. We'll, we'll give her a t shirt. <laughs> give her a gift. All right, card. Susan. Take it. <laughs> All right, Susan, you can thank uh, Renovo um, for that one. So, wait, wait, confirm the answer, though. What was the answer? It was North Augusta and Chicago. Augusta and Chicago. Okay. Yeah, it's like 900. Right. That's like the yeah, best. It runs, it runs to like Ukrainian, Ukrainian village, village. And then I actually knew it in Oak Park. I had a friend who went to Fenwick. Like, it actually it goes oh. past the city there. It keeps going west of Austin Avenue. I thought the question oh. when you started talking about Iowa, I thought it was going to be about the grilled cheese vendor outside the union back in the day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to do that. Was no, you, you know what I'm talking stuff. about. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, know well, what I, you know what I figured? We did the Quad Cities with Blake already one time because he's a Quad City guy. So <laughs> yeah, no, that, was, that was my go-to. So, all right. Awesome. Thanks, Joe, for coming on. Tom, thank you as always. Listeners, smash that like button. And what we need you to do is refer us to your friend. Uh, leave us a, a review um, whether on iTunes or Amazon or wherever you're getting this podcast downloaded from. Please leave us five stars. Joe, thank you. Tom, thank you. And listeners, we will see you next week. Thanks, all. Thanks, guys.